to start the stream. So, um, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I'm going to be creating a, a module for Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes, and I'm going to walk you through it. I will be going fast because obviously I want to, you know, get some stuff done within, you know, not not too long a time. Uh, but so let's let's dive straight in. So here is my um, folder in which I have all of the modules that I have uh, created or that I maintain, and right at the top I have this. A uh, folder that I call blank, which is a blank module. I'm going to take a copy of that and call it black hole, right? And then I'm going to use my uh, text editor and replace all instances. Actually, let me make that a bit smaller so you guys can still see those messages. There you go. Um, uh, and I'm going to search and replace module name with black hole in every file inside. Uh, Ktain, what? Come on. Fine, I will do it this way. There you go, black hole. Um, no, and replace all. Yep, and that was nine occurrences. Then we have a module ID, which is black hole without a space. Five occurrences, and then we have module URL, which is black hole with a percent twenty in it, which stands for a space in a web address. Now that we've done that. I'm going to open a console and I'm going to go to uh, here, uh, black hole. And there are two uh, batch files here which I use to set things up. So, first of all, there is rn, which is going to rename some files which are called module name something. It's going to put in the name of the module there. So, this expects the module name, which is black hole, and the module ID, which is black hole. Right? So, now that this has been done, I can delete those, uh, that, that batch file. And just to show you that it worked inside manual, we now have blackhole.html. Um, ah, uh, you want a link to the uh, Google Doc? That is uh, perfectly fine. Go to voice text on the Discord, and I posted it there. Um, now uh, the next thing is oh, there we go. Eternity Shack posted it in the uh, in the chat here. Thank you, Eternity Shack. Didn't even think of posting it there myself. Um, okay, so the other batch file uh, is called mk. Now this one creates so-called directory junctions, which are um, they they look like subdirectories, but they point to somewhere else on my system. So this one here is the mods folder. So every time I build the mod in Unity, it will go directly into the keep talking folder, so that I can use it directly in the game. And all the other things here are part of the actual mod kit. So I don't need to update all of my um, copies of it every time the mod kit changes. I can, you know, they, they, they become updated automatically. So let's just run that and delete that batch file. The next thing I'm going to do is start a um, repository on GitHub, um, which I do here, new repository, a repository named Black Hole, a module created by Tim Way Create Repository. And then we copy and paste this link here. And we open source tree, which is the uh, program that I use to, to do Git repositories locally. Um, let me put in my password there. Let me do this so that you can still see things. There you go. Um, so let's open this directory contain a black hole. It's not a valid repository, of course. I need to uh, create one first. Let's go here, browse in black hole. Select that folder, please. Thank you. Black hole, git, and do not use that. I, uh, I personally, I found this to be buggy, so I, I just create the repository myself. The destination path already exists. Yes, we do want to create that. Um, and then here are all the files that, um, you know, that, that, that become part of the mod. As you can see, the parts of the Katain mod kit are already in the list. So here's, you know, here's some uh, DLLs, for example. Here are the shaders that I might be using. Here's the test harness, which allows me to test the module in Unity. We'll get to all of that later. So let's just select all, I mean stage all, and make a first commit. Uh, bang. Okay. Now, in add remote, we're going to add this uh, URL that I just copied from GitHub. Make that the default remote, okay? And then I can click push, uh, click that, and it will upload the data to the GitHub website. 
Simon Singh's flashbacks. <laughs> uh, you're right. The other stream started out pretty much exactly the same. So now if we go to uh, GitHub and reload this page, you will see that the first commit is there. All the, all the code is right here. So, okay. Now. Now I'm going to open Unity and I'm going to open the project that we just created, Black Hole. It, it's not going to be an empty looking module like Blind Alley now. I mean, that wouldn't be a black hole, would it? A black hole is black and the modules aren't black. So I'm going to actually have a sort of circular black thing on it. I have a bit of an idea in my head of what, what this will look like. And um, I guess we'll check that out. OK, so here we have Unity. I'm going to uh, open the scene, which has the no, it does not have the module in there. So let's put the module in there. Let's put the test harness in there. And let's also make this a little smaller. Because uh, usually, of course, I use the full width of the... Uh, uh, actually, let's move the camera slightly away so this is a bit smaller, so that I have more space to, uh, you know, to, to have the settings there. OK, so um, there are a few things that I need to set here. I need to set the script, which is, of course, black hole module. Uh, I said these three variables here, which are BOM, which is which gives me the edge work, module, which is the, the module itself, um, and audio, which allows me to play sounds. But I, I don't know if this uh, if this module is going to have sound. Maybe not. Uh, I have no I have no current plans. But if any of you can think of good sounds once the module is working, then I'm happy to uh, consider adding them. Okay. <laughs> so. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is I want to create some graphics that I will be using on the module. And um, I'm, I'm going to make these graphics using c -sharp code, um, but they're not going to be models. It's going to be a flat uh, black circle. Um, I have this Katane stuff uh, um, project here in Visual Studio in which I... Uh, okay. Interesting. Um, I will let that con uh, conversation carry on. Um, hmm. Okay. Um, so in this um, contain stuff thing, I have. Uh, okay, let me open this here. Okay, I have lots and lots of files here with lots and lots of code. So, for example, for Battleship, those of you who know this, right? There is some code here that uh, generates, for example, the highlight. There is some. Uh, you know, the, the graphic for the water, etc. So all of this code that I wrote to generate graphics and models, etc. is all in this contained stuff repository. So now for black hole, we're going to create this in a new file. And we're going to create a method to generate the models. And I want this to be public. And I want this to be static. There we go. Okay, now um, let me quickly copy one of these lines. Um, and put that in here. Um, let's oh come on. Let's add system.io. Um, and then here we have black hole, and the first model is going to be. Oh, I'm an idiot. We don't actually want to create models yet. Actually, I'm just going to remove that line. We want to create graphics. So let's call this create graphics. So the first graphic is going to be literally just a black circle. But I think I'm going to give it a sort of bluish outline that might look like a bit of a glow. Uh, we'll, we'll see how that looks. So I'm going to start with graphics util uh, dot uh, draw bitmap. Um, how wide should it be? I'm going to make it, well, actually, I'm going to make it all dependent on a constant. Uh, like, I don't know, let's start with 500. Um, Right, and then we clear that with um, transparency, and then we draw on it. So let's start by filling an ellipse, going, oh yeah, um, the brushes dot black, uh, going from, I don't know, let's start at uh, 5, 5, and then with minus 2 times that. So um, let's, let's give that a name, let's call it the padding. 
because that's how far away it'll be from the edge. So padding, padding, and only minus two times padding. Okay, and then I'm going to save that as, um, let's see, in Catane we have black hole, assets, textures. Aha, I do not have a textures directory yet, so let's create that and let's put that in there. Um, <laughs> black hole, I guess, not PNG. So now if I run this, and then I go to this directory, we have an actual black hole.png. As you can see, it is a black circle. Now, I want to draw an ellipse uh, with a pen that has a uh, sort of light bluish color. So, um, uh, I don't know. For now, let's just use cornflower blue, I guess. I'll, I can still change that. Uh, and I want it to be uh, maybe five pixels uh, wide. And I want pretty much the same rectangle, so I'm just going to call this rect, but rect, and rect. And now if I run this, and now we have a sort of blue outline. Now this blue outline looks a bit, how shall I say, um, simplistic. Um, and also, I think 5 pixels is far too little. I'm going to increase the padding to 10 and make this maybe 12, and see how that looks. Um, what's the chat saying? Um, can't tell many times Tim we hit end. <laughs> um, no, Rock Dude, I do it with a lot of things. I mean, I did do it with the water graphics in uh, Battleship. I did do it with all of the graphics in Battleship. Except, of course, for the ones that I find on Google Images, right? Sometimes I find something on Google Images and then work from that. Anyway, let's go back here. Okay, so now we have a thicker blue line. But I, I want it to look more like a glow, and I think there is a way to do that. So now, instead of having that color simply be um, sort of opaque, um, I'm going to go color from ARGB. And I can give it an alpha transparency, for example, um, 128, and then use cornflower blue as the uh, base color. Ah, there we go. That looks a bit more like what I was expecting. But I still think it could be... Um, well, let, let's see what it looks like on the module. Um, let's go here. Let's create... Uh, let's first of all press apply and save so that I don't lose anything. Now, create an empty object, which I'm going to call uh, the black hole, I guess, or just hole. I don't know what to call it. We want a mesh renderer and a mesh filter, and the mesh filter is going to be a quad. And for the mesh renderer, I'm going to create a material, black hole material, which is going to be the diffuse shader from Keep Talking. And we're going to put the black hole texture on it. And... Um, okay, I, I cannot currently see it. Let's see, it's probably, hmm, why can I not see it? Uh, let me rotate it around to see if I'm, like, oh, there we go. Okay, there is something, this is not quite what I expected. Um, ah, it's because I didn't assign the material, so let's assign that material, there we go. Okay, so I actually want that rotation to be, um, um, okay, I'll, I'll use numbers then. 0, 0, 0, and then make this like 90, and then uh, move it up a little. There we go. Okay, but now we see that the transparency is not showing. You, you can see there is a, a black rectangle around it. We don't want that. So how do I get rid of that? I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to have to need a different shader transparent. Let's try that. Bingo. Okay, that's more like what we wanted. Let's make this slightly bigger so that it'll fill the whole module. Let's also move it slightly to the left. Mm, maybe not quite so much. If I do this, then I can still make it slightly bigger. Uh, no, I don't actually want it this big. Uh, you will see in a second why. Let's apply and save. Okay, so now we have a black hole. 
Mm. I have feeling that texture was created by using paintbrush. Mm. Okay. Um, okay. Now I want that black hole to be clickable because in order to solve the module, you you have to like you know click on it or hold it or or something. So I'm going to add a component here called KM selectable, which is a keep talking uh, specific thing that makes it clickable. The parent has to be the module, and we're going to create a highlight for it. And this is going to be KM highlightable. Uh, I always set the scale to 111 because otherwise it defaults to some scaling which I don't know and I prefer to be in control. Um, the highlight is highlight. Let's apply that. I think that should be it for this. Now if we go to black hole module, we have a children array here, uh, which I'm going to just uh, make one and unity disappears. It literally just disappears randomly in the middle of nowhere. Scale it, little up, move down. Okay. Um, so let's... God, it didn't... It didn't save the window position. Not helpful. Okay, so let's open the scene again. And we're back. Um, so I was here, I was doing the children. I was adding hole and giving that a one. Let's apply and save. And now let's let's check that everything else that I just did is still there. The hole is there, the highlight is there. Um, yep, that all seems to be there. Okay, very good. So I didn't actually lose much work there. I will upload the video of the whole stream again when I'm finished, yes. Um, actually, I haven't uploaded even the previous stream yet. Maybe I should do that. I've been meaning to edit it so that it's more watchable, so it's not, you know, just a three-hour kind of thing. Um, <laughs> yes, you are right. You are overthinking this. You are going to t touch a black hole in this module. So, okay, now I want to do something. Um, how do I explain this? You hold a binder right after you detonate, correct. <laughs> okay, so I want to have a sort of swirling thing around the black hole, which will sort of rotate, uh, maybe at different uh, rates. And I want that swirly thing to look a bit like the following. So let's. Uh, Let's create an Inkscape drawing here just, just as a sort of um, um, playground or sandbox, I suppose you could call it. And I want it to look something like... Um, uh, hey, this doesn't look like much, but uh, I'm going to make these curves. So uh, this, I want to be a curve. And uh, let's put that like here or something, put that like here, and then make this a curve, and put that like here or something, that like here or something, and then make this a curve, and put this here or something. Okay. So it looks a little bit like a shark fin, actually. <laughs> um. How do you survive on bomb? Okay. So I'm going to create a um actually let me let me play with this a little more because this could probably look a bit more rounder. Maybe something like this. Maybe make this here a sharper. A bit like this. Maybe like maybe like this. Okay. Right. So the idea then is that we're going to have several of these around the black hole and they're going to just sort of rotate around as a sort of graphical effect. Um, <laughs> shark fins in a black hole seems legit. Well, it, they're not really supposed to be shark fins, obviously. They're supposed to look like the kind of sort of material that you have scattered around a black hole that orbits it. But I don't know. It's it's a stylized black hole. It's not shark. It's black hole wave. <laughs> okay. So, um, 
I want to create an image that is the same size as the one that we've already got, this one, except that it has, you know, the fin. <laughs> I'm going to have to call them fins now, don't I? Um, sticking out the top. So, um, allow me to remind myself. Okay, so there is not much room there for the fin. So I'm going to actually uh, reduce, I'm going to increase the padding for this, see how that changes the, um, wow, it's, okay, the overall size is 500, I should really consider that, so let's make it 50, so that would make it 10%, okay, that is possibly a bit much, but I can still change it later, and I can still scale up the, uh, the, the object in Unity, so it doesn't matter, okay, so I want to create a graphic that is 500 by 500 pixels, just like the original. Um, so let's change this to 500 by 500. Boink. And I'm going to put a circle in the same place where the black hole usually would be. Um, uh, yeah, can we just fill that with something just so I can see it? Um, and then we put that here. Something like that. I don't know. I think I think it needs to be flatter than that, right? Um, I think this is too. Uh, okay, let's let's put it on top. Um, and now it's starting to look like a wizard's hat. Lol. Um, put that here, maybe. Put that like down here or something. Have that here. Have that here. Okay, that this this looks a bit more like what I intended. Suppose we can move that down and move that up, and then also move this up. Right, and now it has a little bump here on the front. Not much of a surprise there because they uh, there you go. That makes it better. Okay, I think that oh, I am still not satisfied. Um, I'm gonna move both of these. Like that. See how no, now it looks more like a shark fin again. Ah, this is really difficult. Um well then, let's let's see what happens if I do this. And um Oh wow, that looks a lot a lot more like what I intended. Why don't I just delete this and just put that there that okay now that is mm, I am still not satisfied I'm probably never gonna be satisfied with life uh, <laughs> oh <laughs> super meat boy I've played that game but I wasn't very good at it I gave up after a while um okay so now what I want okay so to the, uh, those of you who haven't read the manual, right? The uh, the code for one black hole is going to be seven digits, and I want these things to show you how how many digits the black hole still expects. Okay, so they will disappear as you gradually solve the black hole, and then when you've solved it, they'll all be gone. So um, because there's going to be seven for every black hole, I was going to have several copies of these, but in different colors. Right. As in, I was going to have seven copies, but eat. Oh God, how do I explain this? So, you might have. You know what? Actually, I'll just. Um, you know, I have an idea. I'll just. Okay, let's get rid of this and let's let's just uh, generate this graphic. Um, I probably want to generate the same graphic in seven different colors. So actually, instead of. Hmm, it it would be nice if I could literally just uh, export this. In fact, I can. I'm going to save this as a temporary SVG and open it here in my text editor. Hello? Why is my text editor suddenly uh, hanging? Yeah, it stopped responding. That is weird. Let's open it in Visual Studio. Let's see what happens. Okay, there it is. Okay, so here here is some data which defines the curve that we've put in there. So I'm going to copy that, and then here, 
I'm going to create a new bitmap, which has the same size as the previous. Oops. And this time, uh, again, we make it transparent. And now, here's the thing. Uh, we have some SVG data. I wrote some code at some point that can parse this SVG data. If only I can remember what it was called. Parse SVG now. Parse. Okay, SVG path. Path to SVG. Decode SVG path. That's what I called it. So decode SVG path. Uh, dot decode pieces. And we put the SVG data in there. And this gives us an enumerable of path piece. And then we can use these path pieces to generate a uh, graphics path. New graphics path. Uh, yep, that. Um, of our pieces equals. Okay, now I am not entirely sure. Maybe let me check if I have done this before. Um, aha. Okay, so so here we have some code that takes some, you know, some SVG code and turns it into a set of points. Um, but that ah, this was for the gallows in Mafia. That's right. But this one doesn't use curves. This one doesn't use Beziers. So I'm I'm going to skip that and see. Oh, here we have something. Aha, this takes an enumerable of path piece and a Bezier smoothness and gives me a list of points. Yes, this th I'm going to use this. So this is in decode SVG path again. Let's go back here. Decode SVG path dot decode p no um huh. Um, it is called do, but it requires, oh, ah, and oh, okay, I can do this all in one go, so I can just go uh, svg data dot do, no, okay, I'm, okay, um, let, let's check this again, so we have do, this one takes a string, and it is public, static, okay, it's it's not it's not an extension. So let's try that. There we go. SVG data, and then a busier smoothness. Now the um, it's five hundred by five hundred. So I'm guessing one pixel won't make a difference. I'm just gonna make it one, and this gives me a list of pieces. No, this gives me a list of points, doesn't it? I now have an i enumerable of i enumerable of point D. Uh, the reason you get an enumerable of enumerables is because uh, it it could have multiple uh, you know sub shapes in it. So for each, so actually these are polygons, I suppose. So for each uh, polygon in polygons, um, I'm not going to use graphics path. I'm going to uh, fill a polygon. There you go. And for now, I'm going to use uh, black just to see if that works and then we have polygon so each of these points come on uh that each of these points i need to translate to point f because um system.drawing uses float uh, and then to array and then let's save that as i guess i'm gonna call it fin hmm. and here we have our first fin and it looks black let let's make the background white and see see if that um, huh now it's completely white it didn't actually draw anything um well let's take a look at uh what we get so here our first polygon uh let's turn that into an array 16 points those coordinates look totally reasonable um so why would it not work okay if anyone has any idea why this isn't working please let me know um uh 230 hmm. <laughs> um 
I'm not typing in the chat. I am talking. I, I just sometimes read what you guys write and then maybe comment on it. Okay, so why is this not working? Um, I would totally have expected this to work just fine. Again, if any of you have... Oh, I figured it out. You notice that the Y coordinates are all greater than 500. This one's even greater than 600. I know why this is the case. This is because if we go back to that uh, SVG, hmm, Notepad++ doesn't seem to like that SVG. So let's let's open it in Visual Studio again. Okay. Um, if you go back to here, you will notice that there is, of course, this data, but there is also a transform on it. Because, you see, in Inkscape, I moved it around, and when I do that, um, Inkscape just adds a transform instead of recalculating all of the points. So I'm going to have to move the y-coordinate by this amount. So I'm going to... Um, right, let's try that. Point D. Um, that. Now, that should give... There we go. We've got it. Yeah, I am probably the only person, but um, the, the reason I do this is because now I can automate all sorts of things, such as, for example, uh, having the same thing in seven different colors, having the same thing in lots of different uh, rotations. In fact, let me show you this right now. So I can just go for each rotation from 0 to, um, I guess, 360 at uh, intervals of... Um, I, I kind of want, uh, you know... I want a sort of wonky number, so I'm going to make it 7. So you're going to have 7 times 7, so you're going to have 49 all around. So I actually want, um, yeah, let, let, let's actually just go 7. And then let's have an angle, which is 360, uh, divided by 7 times the rotation, right? So that's our angle. Um, actually, I can put that here. Um, and now I can, uh, using var tr equals new graphics transformer g dot rotate at. So I want to rotate by that angle, and I want the middle of the picture. So I get this, and I do this. There you go. And now, ah, okay, this needs to go load. Okay, so um, yeah, let's let's just convert it here. Also, I should probably um, make it different files. So, uh, rotation. Okay, so now let's make this a little smaller. Come on, there you go. See, now we have these, this one I can delete. We have these different fins at different rotations. Test succeeded. There is a period in the middle, that's why. Oh, why it made this a link. Oh, okay. whoops. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yes. It, it's so that you can put things like this, you know, and then people can click on that. Okay. So now I want uh, for each color in uh, some array. Okay, so. What colors do I want? Let's see. Um, Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so for now, I'm just gonna use um, you know standard colors like red, green, uh, blue, yellow, um, orange, um, blue, uh, then the cyan, uh, purple. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven already. So I guess those are the ones that we're going to use. And then we're going to have color. So each color actually wants to have a name. So we're going to have a color color and a string name. So this is going to be red. This is going to be orange. This is going to be yellow. This is going to be green. This is going to be cyan. This is going to be blue, and this is going to be purple. OK, 
Okay. Um, color, oops, color dot name. And then here we're gonna go new solid brush color dot color. There you go. And now we're gonna have lots and lots of graphics. And this would have taken us a lot longer to do in, you know, in any other way. Because this is the power of code, right? You can sort of automate regularity. So you only need to do the, you know, the, the, the unique things once. And everything else you can have the computer automate. Um, okay. So now that we have all of these textures, let's have Unity uh, put them all in. So here they are, they're all listed here. And I'm going to put them all in a, uh, okay, so let's open the black hole. Oh yeah, okay, let, let's open it from Unity. If I double click here, we get another uh, Visual Studio instance. And here I can define a texture, texture array, um, fin textures, I guess I can call them. There you go. And then here, I'm going to lock that. Open this. No, not open this, but just put all of these in there. Whoop, I thought I had locked this. Yes, now it's locked. Now let's put, oh, not that. I guess I want to delete these. And I want to have these. Boink. There we go. Okay, let's apply and save. Okay, the next thing that I want to do... Oh, those fin graphics, I, I made them have a white background. So let's, let's make them transparent again. I noticed this because... Um, do that. I noticed this because Unity uh, shows them with a black background usually here, you see? Okay, so now I can write some code that will use these textures to create a sort of swirling animation. Let's do that. Um, I'm going to have a, um, let me go to here. I'm going to declare a game object called the hole, and the hole is going to be the parent for all of the, uh, um, the, the swirlies. Swirl, that's what I should have called them, not fins, swirls. I'm going to call them swirls. Yeah, that's what they really should be called. But let's delete all of these. I'm, I'm going to change these names. Um, swirl, that's a much better name. Uh, let's run that. And then in the uh, black hole thing, here's the fin textures, I'm going to call them swirl textures. And then hopefully, there we go, swirl textures. Let's lock this, select all of these, and put them in there. Woohoo, boink. That's nice. Okay, now apply and save. Okay, and this um, whole object that we just defined, we want that to be there. And now I can sort of unlock that again. Okay, um, apply and save. And now, when you start the module, I want uh, 49 copies of this, right? Seven uh, swirls for each, you know, the seven swirls, and each of them in a different color. So, each of them in seven different colors. So, uh, for I, whoops, for. For i equals 0 to 49. Uh, also, the color names are red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple. Uh, cyan is the one that I missed. And let's flip that out a comma. Okay, and now we're going to. Um, I'm, I'm going to need an object that I can copy. So. Um, let's create an empty object here. Let's call it a swirl uh, template, I guess. Right, and this is going to have a mesh filter, which is a quad, and it's going to have a mesh renderer, 
with the same material as the black hole, right? But I'm going to change the texture on it, so it's going to look different than this. Um, uh, so let's let's apply that. Save, and let's have a uh, public game object uh, swirl template. And then over here, I suppose I can collapse this list now. This is going to be that. There you go. Apply. OK, so now we can do some cool things. Um, OK, so uh, this new object is going to be, well, let's take the template and uh, instantiate a copy of it, right? And then this. Um, this object, we need to reparent it, give it the same parent as the uh, swirl template, right? And then we're gonna have um, local position zero zero zero, um, local scale one one one. Actually, is it one one one? Well, the hole is the one that has all the you know the positioning and the resizing. So when we apply this underneath hole, it's, it's going to work out. It's going to come out in the wash. So, um, yeah, so that's the scale. Uh, but now the uh, local rotation, which actually I'm going to use Euler angles, um, I want that to rotate about the y axis. And I want it to be 360 divided by 7 times um, i percent 7. No, 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 no. I want it divided by 49 times i, obviously, duh. <laughs> okay, now, this obj is going to have a um, mesh renderer, which has a material, which has a texture, a main texture. And I'm going to apply the swirl texture of um, i% 7. No, that's wrong. Um, hang on, how many swirl textures are there? Hang on, uh, do I really want, want, yeah, I do want 47. It just occurred to me, I don't actually need all of those graphics because I can literally just rotate the game object because I was going to do that with all the others as well. So actually, I'm going to delete all of them again um, and have just one uh, for each color. So let's delete all of these things again. Delete these and um, go back here and now not have rotations, not have this, uh, not have this, and not have this. Run that. Did you make the symbol cycle symbol unit method? Um, so the symbols in symbol cycle are all uh, Unicode characters. I mean, they're obscure and rare Unicode characters, but they're Unicode characters nonetheless. So the shapes I got from actual fonts. So I didn't design all of the symbols. I mean, you know, I didn't design 2,000 separate symbols. Okay, I, uh, I, I got them from somewhere. But yes, I did write code that would uh, render them from a font uh, scale them in such a way that they all fit inside the square and are all centered inside the square. Um, right. Um, okay, so coming back to this, we want uh, to lock this, put all of this here, as well textures. Whoa. Oh, I see. Um, let's zero that out and then. Put them in there. Okay. Now I kind of want them in a different order. I want, uh, you know, red, orange, yellow. Actually, well, yeah. No, I do want them in a different order. So I'm gonna open the um, uh, the, uh, the the prefab, which is this one here. I'm gonna look for the what the heck? It's not opening the. The hell is wrong with Notepad++? I've never seen this problem before. No. Let's open it again. Okay. Here is the SVG that we tried to open earlier, and here's the prefab. So that was a weird bug. Okay, so here we have uh, the swirl textures. 
they're all listed here in some sort of code form, right? And I can see here that red and yellow are at the bottom. So I'm going to move red to the top and yellow here. And then if I save the file, then instantly they are rearranged here. Now orange is here, so I want that here. Red, orange, yellow. The next one should be um, blue. No, I want green and then blue and then there's a green, cyan, blue, purple. This is the order that I want. And this is rainbow order. Um, okay, so now we have seven of those graphics. And now for each of these, I'm going to just say, I pers yep, that is correct. Okay. Now if I actually run this, okay, we are seeing 49 different uh, things here, as you can see, but there's something wrong, right? They're not... Uh, they, they should be all around the uh, the black hole. Why are they all at the top there? Let's take a look at the uh, rotations. They all do have the correct rotation. Um, oh, maybe I should uh, remove the template object. No, that made no difference because all the other ones overlap it anyway. Um, okay, if any of you have any ideas of what I'm doing wrong, please let me know. Apparently, rotating this makes little to no difference. Um, well, let's delete all of these and look at just one of them and see what happens. Ah, ah, of course, because this one here has this uh, 90 degree rotation about the x-axis. Uh, all of these are going to be implicitly rotated by that. So the y-axis is now the wrong axis to rotate them about. And uh, the z-axis is actually the one that I want. Okay, so let's change that, change that here, put that on the Z, on, and run this again. That is interesting. That is not quite how I envisaged it. <laughs> I am definitely going to have to tweak the colors because uh, I didn't mean for it to be so sort of bright and colorful. They're all going to be much more washed out and stuff. Um, so, um, I want the black hole itself to be in front of them. I want those to be behind it. So, I'm going to create another empty object and actually make that the parent. So, this is going to be the actual hole. This is going to be the actual KM selectable. And I'm going to move the highlight in there. I'm going to move the template in there. And I'm going to move the hole that we have in there. And now this one's not going to be a KM selectable anymore. Um, uh, let's press apply. Okay, so now the hole here uh, has the graphics, and the hole here has just the KM selectable. So the parent obviously needs to be the module, and the highlight needs to be the highlight. And um, I guess I'm going to fix those numbers here because it always messes those up. Um, and then we're going to add the uh, game selectable back in here as a child. Okay, now we're still going to see the same thing because the hole is still not at the bottom of it. So I am actually going to um, make them all children of this world template. No, no, if I do that, then instantiating them will instantiate the children as well. So, I'm, I'm going to add another container. I'm going to call this the swirl container. And I'm going to put that above the hole. Okay, apply. Um, and then let's have a public game object swirl container. which is here, and we're going to put that here, okay? And now when we parent these, we're going to parent them to the swirl container. Now if I run this... Hmm, that didn't work... Oh! Sorry, not parent, just that. Okay, so now they're all inside the swirl container, as you can see. Uh, the black hole, for some reason, is still behind them. That is a little strange. Um, 
Hello, hello, hello. Hello. Okay. Um, so I, I want the, the black hole to be in front of it. So I'm guessing that I probably have to move it forward a little. And of course, I don't know which direction is the right one. Apparently not that. Apparently not that. So it is Z, but maybe it's negative. Yeah, it's negative. Okay. So let's do that. So let's uh, do that. Wait, what? Ah, okay. This is because, yeah, okay. Apply, save. Now the swirl template, I think I should probably delete that object once uh, all the uh, copies have been instantiated. So um, the swirl template, I'm going to destroy. Okay, this looks slightly more than, slightly more like what I wanted, but still not quite because the swirls are, you know, too too large. So I need to make them significantly smaller. Fortunately, that is easy to do because I can just um, do this, define a sort of center like here. And then just say to scale this by a factor of like 50% or something. Ah, it, okay, it didn't use that as the center. Okay, fine, then uh, let's just take all of that and move it like here or something. Save this. Um, open the, uh, the, the SVG again. Here we are. Copy all of this data to uh, here. Put that there. And then the transform, let's see if that has changed, or let's not see if it's changed, but let's just update the number. Oh, yeah, there you go, it's still the same number. Then let's run this again. All of the textures are now different. And run this again. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so that's slightly more like what I wanted, but I think I want them to be, you know, to, to sort of stick out of the black hole more. So. La let's uh, go back here. Let's move this. I think I want to change the grid size. Have it a twice as fine grid. And move this up too. Move this up a little. Move this up significantly. Move this up a little. Move this up a little. Actually, it's, I don't know, move it like here or something. Um, okay, let's save that. And copy and paste that in, into here. Run this again. Uh, I didn't check the uh, thing. Five, five, two, three, three. Yeah, that didn't change. Um, so now if I run this. Okay, it's starting to look kind of more like what I wanted, but still not quite. Um, Hmm. Um. There you go. Okay, I think I'm going to make it steeper, as in make it more, uh, uh, make it much more like, you know, pointing to the side like this. Um. Something much more like this. That there. Yeah, let's let's do that. Save that. Copy that. Put that here. Uh, run that. Go to Unity and run this. Okay, it's starting to look more and more like what, I, what I'm trying to achieve. Now, um, I guess at this point I can make this bigger. Yeah, let's make it one six. One six, 
There we go. Apply. Save. Um. Hmm, I wonder what you actually wrote there. What, what is this? Um. I don't say that. I don't say colon close parenthesis, do I? <laughs> yeah, because I never actually say this specific thing. So yeah, anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make those swirls uh, semi-transparent as well. Uh, just like I did with the outline of the... Um, um, with the outline of the black hole. There we go. And I'm going to make them move. So I'm going to start a coroutine here. Uh, move swirls, I guess I'm going to call it. And then I'm going to say while true. Var angle. No, hang on. Um, oh yeah, var angles equals new... Um, Okay, so let, let me think. Every seventh one of them has the same color. So I should probably... Um, I should probably order them in a different way. I should probably have the first seven be, you know, the red ones, then the next seven be the orange ones. So this would be I divided by seven, but then this here is going to be a little bit more interesting. So let's see. Um, I want to take I want to take i percent 7 multiply that by 7 and then add i di i divided by 7 right and then that that's a little weird but uh okay so our angles are going to be a new float array of size 7 right and then for oh yeah and and also uh var rotation speeds is equal to new float 7, 7, and for each of those, uh, the, rot the rotation speed um, is going to be uh, random between, like, let's say, 1 degree per second. No, that's, that's a bit too slow. 10 degrees per second and maybe 30 degrees per second. There you go. Oh yeah, sorry, random range is uh, obsolete. Range is the one I want. There you go. Right, and then I'm going to say for uh, all of the 49 of them, angles of i is plus equal to rotation speeds i times the delta time, which is the time uh, elapsed since the last frame. Oh wow, no, nobody told me that this is obscuring the message on the top of the screen. What? It has stopped responding again. Oh, damn it. That, is, that must be OBS doing it. Anyway. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna say... Actually, why don't I just say that for all seven, there you go, the angles, and then for the seven swirls, I'm gonna say... Um, uh, I forgot to save the object somewhere, so I'm going to have to create an uh, array here, and I'm going to make it an array of transforms as worlds. And because it's private, I'm going to lowercase it. Okay, so, and then here I'm going to say swirls i is equal to obj, uh, which means that I can literally just do this. Um, Replace all object transform with that. So, oops. Okay, now why is this? Why is oh because oh there you go. Okay, so this doesn't work because this returns a game object. So swirl template. I'm gonna make that a uh, transform as well, and I suppose that that should be a transform as well. Uh, what do I need hole for again? I'm not actually using hole, so I guess I'm going to remove that for now. And now that I've changed the types, I'm going to have to re uh, reassign these. They're going dis to disappear here. So the template is this, 
the container is this. Uh, apply these, and then yeah. The, thank you, Eternity Shack. That's very helpful. Um. Okay. So um. So we've got all these swirls of eye. So swirls of um eye. Okay, so the first seven are going to be red. And so I want i times 7 plus j. And I want the uh, local rotation of that in Euler angles be 0, 0. And now the rotation, now the rotation is going to be uh, angles i plus 360 divided by 7 times i. Um, I think that should do it. Okay. Which, by the way, means that we can delete this because the angles are just going to be set by the coroutine. So let's go back to Unity and run this. What is this? Oh, the Unity bug reporter from the crash earlier. Um, null reference exception. Right, I forgot to instantiate the array. Uh, swells equals new array. Uh, of 49 elements. Thank you. Come on. Don't keep us waiting. Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, I know what's wrong. Right. I, I crashed Unity and I know why, so I'm, I'm gonna kill Unity. Hang on. Uh, let's kill that and start it again. The reason why is because I have a while true loop here and I forgot to do the yield return null which tells it to wait a frame. So it was doing this over and over again, never got, uh, never allowed Unity to do anything in between. Um. Oh, come on, Unity, why? Why you not remember window? There we go. Open the scene and run it. Okay. This is kind of what I wanted, except all of them are in the same location, so all of them are on top of each other. Oh, can't destroy. Ah, okay, right, I have to pass in the uh, game component, the game object. Okay, right, so the Euler angle should be. Hang on, right, um, plus, right, this should have been times j. Oh, yeah, and I wanted it to go the other way around, so I'm gonna say minus here. Wow, there we go. That looks kind of more like what I wanted. And now all I want is for the colors to be much less saturated. So I want all of those colors to be more, um, you know, grayish, I guess, or maybe a bit yellowish, but, you know, still yeah, I, I guess I can tweak those colors later. So now, let's try and implement the actual logic, the actual uh, solving algorithm. So, we have our uh, manual here. And in this manual, we have a table. Um, is the person who created this table for me here in the chat? If so, please speak up. I cannot remember who... Um, created this table. Somebody uh, submitted that as a suggestion. Uh, let me take a look at the history, perhaps. Um, oh, it doesn't list the person here. Um, okay, what's local Euler angles? Okay, uh, I will explain that. Hang on. Um, okay, so you see how every object, like let's take the hole for example, it has the position, rotation, and scale options, right? And each of them have x, y, and z components. And the rotation is expressed in so-called Euler angles, which is basically an x angle, a y angle, and a z angle. And the reason I use local Euler angles is because local rotation in the code is actually expressed in an object called a quaternion, which is um, some mathematical construct that you know I don't really understand. So using the Euler angles is a much more intuitive way to to express rotations. Thank you, Eternity Shack. <laughs> I hope my explanation was adequate. Do, do feel free to ask more questions if something was unclear. Okay, 
So uh, the angles that Unity shows here in the uh, in the property thing, those are the Euler angles. Okay. Whew. Okay. Now, let's first of all take this table. Oh yeah, the person who created the table is he here? If not, then okay, you're welcome. Okay. Right, I suppose for now I can use this table, but I may have to, you know, generate a new table because I don't know what the statistical properties of this table are. But for now, let's uh, let's go in and um, we'll have a private int array array um, table equals. Uh, let's see how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna take all. Oh, oh gosh, it's just a list of numbers. Uh, you know what? I can't be bothered. I'm just gonna make it an actual list of numbers um, like that and then I'm gonna say split oh, I don't have a split okay fine um, I'm going to get the split function from um, so let, let me create a new class which I'm gonna call ut because that's what I always do make it a static class and then let's open uh, a class that I have here in rtutil um, called extension methods, uh, ienumerable extensions, I guess, and it's called split. Splits the specified ienumerable at every element. Does that no? Um, no. There are more splits. Splits a collection to chunks of equal size. This is what I want. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is what I want. Okay, let's go here. Put that here, and now I can use me a split. So here I can say. Split this using uh, black hole. Namespace black hole. There you go. Bingo. Split this into groups of seven, and then for each such group, turn it into an array. Why did? Why is this all? Um. Oh, okay. And turn the whole thing into an array as well. There you go. Now it works. Okay. So that is actually a table of seven by seven now. Okay, so the first thing uh, that the black hole needs to do at the start is to put itself into a list. Okay, let me do this step by step. So we are going to need a list, but it's going to be a static one because uh, each of the separate instances of the black hole module need to share this list. Right? They all need to be looking at the same list. Uh, furthermore, I'm not actually going to make it a list. I'm going to make it a dictionary that maps from string to a list. And the list is going to contain black hole modules. Now, um, why a dictionary? Well, that string that I'm going to be using as a key is going to be the bomb serial number. Okay, so I'm going to identify the bomb from its serial number, and then the list is going to contain uh, all the black hole modules on the same bomb. So, um, if a dictionary contains key bomb dot get serial number, uh, that's a string. Um, well, if it does not contain it, no, if it does contain it, then we're just gonna say, ah, let's get the serial number, please. Var serial number equals that. So that dot add this. Else, um, create a new list. And while we're at it, put this in there. Okay. And now I'm also going to start a coroutine uh, that will compute the solution code. Okay. Now, why do I make that a coroutine? Well, because you see, this module has just added itself to the dictionary, but you don't know if there are any other copies of black hole that haven't put themselves into the list yet. So I'm just going to wait for one single frame like this and then compute the solution code because now I know that the uh, you know that all of the black holes are in the list. However, only one of the modules will need to compute the uh, uh, solution code. So I'm actually going to um, okay. So these are the uh, modules and these are the solution codes. Oh, damn it! Solution codes. There you go. Okay, so um, at this point, I'm going to check if the solution code is already in there. Um, 
on dot get serial number. You know, I hate having to get the serial number so many times. So you know what? I'm actually just gonna uh, whoops, God. string serial number. I'm gonna put that in here. There you go. So if if the dictionary already contains this, then um, then we know what then you know then it's already there. But if it is not in there, then we need to calculate it now. So let's take a look at the rules. Of, okay, who did this? Who has edit access to this? Oh, it's just a jet turning to shack. Okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> it turned into Shaq. He didn't ask what a string is. He said he remembers it. Okay, so no, a string, a sparker boy, a string is just a piece of text in your mem memory, which you can use to do anything. Right? You can use it to output some text, or you can use it to have some text that you need to process further. Like, Or you could have a logging message, which you put into the debug log. There we go, Eternity Shack mentioned the debug log. Uh, but you can also use strings to, you, know, you can put strings together to form new strings, etc. Anyway, so let's take a look at the uh, rules of how to determine the solution code. So we have a 10 by 10 grid. And we want to find a starting location, which is given by the third and sixth characters of the serial number, which we know are always digits. So uh, let's do that. Var x is equal to serial number. Uh, OK, so the first character is 0. So the second is 1. So the third is 2. right? But this is a character, so I need to subtract 0 to get the actual numeric value. And then the y coordinate is, of course, 5 which is the sixth character. Yes, Barker boy, exactly. It, well, actually, not quite. I mean, a variable is something that contains the value, right? But the string itself is literally the text itself. You could have multiple variables contain the same value. You can have, um, you know, let's... OK, so for example, if I were to write like, you know, I don't know, um, string my name is Timwe, I can type, and uh, string your name equals my name, right? At this point, you will have two variables with the same value. OK, so it's technically the same string. There is only one location in memory that has this string in it. But both of the variables point to it. OK, if, uh, if you heard some music there, sorry about that. I accidentally hit a key. Maybe I should uh, close this down so that that doesn't happen again. OK, let's go back to the coding. So now we have the x and the y coordinates. So, um, uh, and the length of the code is going to be uh, the uh, number of items in that list that we had uh, times 7. <laughs> times 7. Right? Um, yep, 7 times the total number of black hole modules. Very good. So, um, so you, we have our starting location. Oh, and we also have a direction of movement, which is 45, time, 45 degrees times the number of ports on the bomb clockwise from north. So um, var direction is equal to, well, I'm just going to count the ports, um, get ports count, um, and then there are eight compass points. I'm going to take that modulo eight. So now zero equals north, one equals uh, northeast, etc. Okay. Um. Okay. So now, um, right. Um, solution code equals empty string, and then for zero to length. OK, so we want to start at our coordinates x and y, right? And that's right. For the first digit, we want, we want to use only one digit. So let's go from 0 to i plus 1. So if i is 0, we want one digit. And we want to um, add the current number, which is grid, uh, what did I call it, 
uh, table, I called it table. I'm, I'm going to rename that to grid because that's why I thought it was. Um, x and y. And then I'm going to say x, right, um, if, uh, so I, I, now I need to move forward in the direction that we have. So if the direction is equal to 1, uh, 2, 3, then I need to uh, uh, increment x, else if direction is equal to 2, 3, 4, uh, 5, 6, or 7, then I need to subtract x, right? Except that I'm going to make it um, x plus 1 modulo 10, so that, uh, so that it always stays within the range. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Yes, I think it's correct. And then if the direction is equal to uh, 7 or 0 or 1, then y needs to be uh, decremented. Else, if the direction is equal to 3, 4, or 5, then y needs to be incremented. There we go. Okay, so now. This is wrong. Uh, var digit equal to zero. Digit is equal to digit plus uh, plus the digit in the grid percent ten, and then the solution code plus equal digit. Okay. Let's see. Um, Sure. Uh, if you want to learn C sharp, there are lots of possible uh, tutorials on the web. There are lots of tutorials for total beginners as well. So um, you know, don't be intimidated. Just um, search around for a while to find a tutorial that suits you. I'm sure you will find something. Okay. So, and then after we found each digit. Uh, the direction needs to be incremented by 1% 8. So we, we always go 45 degree clockwise. Is that right? Uh, yes, 45 degree clockwise. Okay. Oh, the sum is always modulo 5, not modulo 10. So we actually want this to be modulo 5. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rock dude. Um, Piggard, I can name several things that you do not suck at, but yeah, just don't say that, okay? I have some experience with Racket. I'm not actually familiar with Racket myself. Is that a programming language? I'm going to take a look at that. Let's see if, uh, let's see, that's, um, there, it is a programming language. Interesting. Racket, formula PLT schema. No, not heard of that. Let me see some example codes here. Uh, programming environment. Oh, there we go. Example code. No, oh, I see. It has these parentheses. So it's a bit like a Lisp language. Um, okay, it's a functional language that uses uh, um, functional. <laughs> She's like, okay, so that's uh, that's very interesting. Yeah, I'm not going to respond to that. Um, okay, where were we? Okay, so now that we've got our solution code, I think I'm going to um, output the solution code. Uh, debug.log format, um, black hole solution code is equal to solution codes. No, um, solution code. Um, Ah, I see. A solution codes a serial number. There you go. So we actually need to put that in there. Serial number, serial number equals solution code. There you go. Okay, so now if we go to Unity and run this, let's see if it generates a uh, solution code at all. Index out of range, of course. Let's see. That was in line 78. Let's take a look at 78. Grid X, Y. Why did I think that the grid needed to go in chunks of 7? Of course, it's a 10 by 10 grid, so it's chunks of 10, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Yep, it is 10. 
so that's what it should be. Format except yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's right. I forgot the uh, module ID here. Okay, we have a solution code here. Oh, and there is. Why did I put a number sign in front of that? Okay, it's one four three four three three one. Let's see if that is correct. The um, initial coordinates were four three, so uh, zero to four to three. So it should have started with a zero. So no, this is not correct. Um, I have no idea how we got a one. Um, well, let's say it did this instead, the one here, right? Then um, the next one would indeed, no, it would not. The next one would have to be four plus three. So the next one would, would have been a three, not a four. So this is completely wrong. So I need to find out what's going on. So um, at the, there you go. So here I'm going to output a log message. Uh, with the x and y coordinates. Okay, so that is at the beginning of every digit. So let's see. Okay, so we start at 0, 06. Oh no, we start at 0, 07. There we go, which is correct. And the first digit is supposedly a 0. Two, four, six, seven. Yep, that is a zero. So this time it was correct. And then the next time is zero, six, which is also correct. And it should go diagonal. So three plus two modulo five should be another zero. But we're getting a four. Why is that? Even though the next corner, two, four, is correct. Um, okay. Well, I noticed there is a zero here as well. So let's see what happens if the entire table is actually. Um, you know, flipped. That's it, of course. You split it into chunks of 10, so you get rows of 10, and then you get 10 rows of that, and the Y is, of course, the row, and then in the row you want X. So that is what was wrong. Now, let's see. Uh, we start at 5, 1, which is 2, 4, 5, there we go, it's a zero. We did get a zero. And then we go north and we add this one and the two that gives us a three. No, we're getting a four. Um, yeah, why did it go from five one? To oh, I'm an idiot. It doesn't always start by going north. It's the number of ports that matter. And the number of ports here is two, which means we go east. So that is actually correct. So we started out. Um, here, oops, we started out here at the zero, um, and then we went east, so this four and this zero is this, are the second digits, and then we're here, so the next digit is a four, and then for three, we have one, three, and two, those add up to one, so we are now here, and the next digit is a one, yes, it is a one, uh, and now we want four digits, one, two, three, four, that should be a zero. Zero, zero, two, three, that adds up to five. So it's a zero. Very good. I, I think it is working. We have one, two, three, four, five. That adds up to four. Yep, we got a four. Okay, I think it's working. Pretty confident that this is working. Okay, so now let's take a look at the input mechanism. Okay, um, I have described the input mechanism in words here, but um, I actually created a text file somewhere. Let's see if I still have that here. Black. Yep, there you go. Um, this is a bit of a graphical representation. Um, so let me quickly explain um, for those of you who haven't read the manual. What I want is like, let's say, yeah, let's say your solution code is like 0, 1, 2. Okay? For each of these digits, you have to do what it tells you here in the table. I had a harder version, I had an easier version, but I think I've now settled on this compromise, so this is the one that I'm going to implement. So I'm actually going to get rid of these. Right, so um, final. This is the final version. Well, actually, I'm going to leave the others in just for you to see. 
Okay, so what this means is these dots here represent ticks of the countdown timer on the bomb. So like, you know, it might go 10 seconds, then 9 seconds, then 8 seconds, then 7 seconds, right? Uh, vertical lines means that you have to tap the module in between those two seconds, in between those two ticks. And these brackets here uh, mean that you need to hold the module for that amount of time. I mean, the exact amount of time is not important, just as long as one tick of the timer is in between. Okay. Similarly, this one here is two separate clicks on two separate uh, seconds. Then here you have just a bracket, then you have a longer bracket that needs to contain two ticks. So you need to hold the module for that long. And then here there are simply two brackets one after the other. Now, um, I think I want to change this around because this one here is the simplest one. Uh, so I actually want zero to be that, and I'm going to put that in here. Okay, that, that looks much nicer. And I think I want this one here to be the number four, because it, it looks like an elegant sort of ending to this, so I'm going to do that. And now I'm considering if maybe instead of having a click and then a uh, no, I think this is fine because, yeah. See, I was briefly considering m moving this here so that it would be, you know, a hold and then a uh, click. But the problem with this is that this hold, uh, you would then have to wait an entire second just to convince the module that you're not going to click again, right? So it's better like this because this way, m when you click, then the module will have to wait the next second anyway to find out whether you're going to hold it or do another click. Right, and, and by the way, that's also part of the reason why I didn't want this. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try and implement this and, and, and see if it works. So, um, I need a variable. Yeah, it, it reminds you a little bit of rhythms because you have to wait for those dongs on the module, but mine uh, refers to the actual count on time on the bomb, not the, uh, you know, not, there is no separate, or, oops, uh, I meant to go to Unity. Because as you say this, it occurs to me that the module requires um, uh, the timer to be visible. Here, it requires timer visibility. So I'm going to click that so I don't forget this. Okay, so. The um, so now we need a um, yeah, um, I'm just gonna call this a uh, selectable, uh, and this is gonna be the whole the, the thing that you actually click on. Um, come on, come on, come on, there you go, selectable. Let's put the whole in there, apply, save, okay, and then this selectable is going to get an on interact handler. Uh, which is um, um, yeah okay um, I'm going to call it mouse down and mouse up because um, that's usually what these kinds of events are called so let's generate that method let's generate that method and let's move them further down uh, below this code now what do I need to keep track of First, I need to keep track of how many digits have already been entered. And once again, this needs to be across all of the black holes. And two, I need to keep track of how many digits you still need to enter because, you know, there is this rule that allows you to shorten the code. And we'll get to that. So, um, hmm. why is that? Oh, there's a duplicate. I'm an idiot. Um, okay. So, uh, we already have these two separate dictionaries, all with, you know, all um, mapping from the bomb serial number to some information. And there is only going to be more information. So now, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare a class which is going to contain... Um, information about all the modules on the bomb. So I'm going to call it black hole info or something. And I'm going to put the list of modules. I'm going to call it black hole bomb info because it's one info object for every bomb, right? And this will have a list of modules. 
uh, like that, and it will have a solution code. It will have a uh, digit entered, which starts at zero, and it will have a digit expected, which starts at seven times the number of uh, modules on the bomb. So, uh, yeah. So now we are going to have a dictionary that maps from these two black hole bomb info, black hole bomb info. <laughs> uh, infos equals new dictionary, and then we're just going to get rid of the other two. Right. And I suppose we can actually put a read only uh, read only modifier on this because we're not, I mean, we are going to modify the dictionary, but we're not going to modify the variable which points to the dictionary. It's always going to be the same dictionary. Right. So um, now, here in start, I'm going to say if infos contains key, then infos. Um, then we create a new object, and then in the list of uh, modules, we're going to add this. Which means that we're probably just going to do that. So this way, we generate this new object when it doesn't exist, and we add the module regardless. Okay, and then when, when it comes time to compute the solution code, then um, we are going to say if uh, infos serial number dot solution code equals null, okay, because it will start out as null. In fact, I'll make that explicit here, okay, that it starts out as null to say that it hasn't been computed yet. And then, um, okay, this is info serial number dot modules dot count, okay, and then here we're going to say info serial number dot solution code equals solution code. Okay, so now the solution code has been computed, and uh, I guess I'll put that, that here. And I can get rid of this because we've debugged this. Okay. So now we have this object. So um, Initially, the digit entered is zero. Digit expected should be the full length of the solution code. So I'm going to say uh, digit expected is equal to solution code dot length, which actually is the same as you know this, which is len. So I, I suppose I can just put that in there. Okay. Whew. Um, okay, now let's, let's start with this, this mouse down and mouse up. So I'm going to have a list of sort of events that happen, you know, whether it's a click or a hold or something. Um, and each of them, I'm gonna, um, you know, I'm gonna tag them with the, digits on the, the total number of, sorry, not digits, seconds, the total number of seconds remaining on the timer. So I'm going to have a private list of, uh, I think I'm going to call it, I'm going to make it a string. Um, oops, sorry. Events. Actually, let's make this clearer and call it mouse events. Right. So when you mouse down, then mouse events dot add, um, down plus the time, uh, get time, and I want the integer part of that. Um, does this actually give me seconds? It doesn't say. Um, returns time remaining on the bomb in seconds. Perfect. Perfect. That is what I want. Okay. So when you Press it down. Uh, this is so hard because there are actually three types of events. There is mouse down, there is mouse up, and then there is a uh, change in the number of seconds. So actually, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to have a uh, update function, right? And I'm going to have a private uh, int last seconds, right, okay, um, if bomb.get time 
integer time. Okay, let's let's, let's uh, put that in a variable. If this is not the same as the last time, I'm going to call that time. Uh, then uh, events, at this point I suppose I can call it events. Oh, huh. what is going on? What is it? This is really buggy. Okay. Okay, events dot add time. Uh, actually, let's call it a tick. That's a better name for the actual event. Okay. So, um, return false. And then here, events dot add up return false. Now, ooh, ah, this one is actually a void. Okay. Right. So now we have this list of events. Now, at every point when the list of events changes, we need to check whether, you know, the sequence of events is valid. So um, I'm going to put a check events call here, uh, move that method to the bottom, and then also put a check events here and here. Okay. Now, there are several things that can happen. So the first thing that can happen, let's close all of the other things. The first thing that can happen is that you just have a timer tick and then another timer tick, in which case we don't care because nothing happened in between. So we're just going to remove the first one. Okay. So if events zero equals tick and events one equals tick, uh, then events that remove at zero. Okay. Um, also, if events dot count is less than two, then let's just not do anything. Okay, so if we have two ticks, one after the other, then we just get rid of the first one. Now, um, so let, let's see if we have this. So in order to identify this, we need tick, then mouse down, then tick, then mouse up, and then another tick. Right, we need that third tick to distinguish it from this one here because after the mouse up here, there should be another mouse down. Okay, so if events dot um, sequence equal, um, okay, so if it's equal to tick down tick up tick, then we have successfully entered a zero. Okay, so um, I'm going to call this process a method that will process a, a digit that we entered. I'll write that method later. Um, and then we want to um, remove range from zero. We want to remove the first five. Actually, because that tick might be necessary to identify the beginning of the next one. I'm only going to remove four and we're still going to have tick, right? And then, you know, this, this might happen next time. So in fact, I'm going to put while here just in case several of them, um, right? In, in that case, I suppose I need to put that here. Okay. So if that is the case, then we do that. Else if events.sequence equal Okay, so the next thing, so this is going to be tick uh, down up, tick down up, tick. Okay, I think I want to write this a little bit more succinctly. I'm going to put at here and change these into just commas because now I can just write this all as one string. Whoops, yep, like that. Okay, so here I want tick down up tick, down, up, tick. And now it occurs to me that I can actually just have a private static string array array um, uh, events per digit, right? So this, um, yeah, split, there you go, this is for the zero. Then this is for the one, right? Um, we can also make that read only because that will never change. And then we can say 
um, var input is equal to uh, events per digit dot um, index of oh, oh yeah array no actually wait wait okay I'm gonna uh, copy another method from my uh, extension methods here called index of which allows me to find the index within a I enumerable of something let's put that here okay um, Okay, so now I want to find the first um, list, the first list, which is a sequence equal to events. In this measure, we're going to notice that anything for 30 minutes. <laughs> I was just thinking that. I'm hoping that you're all watching in awe and... <laughs> and wonder but you know if everyone wants to leave that's fine with me too okay so now we found found okay so if input is not equal to minus one uh, which means that it's not in the list then we process when then we process that input else if now here's the thing if the input contains anything um see the thing is ugh, if, if at any point, like for example, let's say you have a tick and then you do a click and then you have another click and then you have a mouse down, but then, you know, you hold it for like two seconds, right? Then that's an invalid input and that needs to give you a strike and it needs to clear the list. So how do I best do that? Uh, <laughs> hello, rock dude. <laughs> So if anyone has any suggestions on how to do this, that would be interesting. So what I can do now is I can find the correct inputs, but how do I verify that there is, ah, I know why, I know how. I need to make sure that none, I, I need to make sure that there is still a valid um, event list that starts with what we have. So, um, else, if um okay else uh valid prefix let's call it that let's find the first uh list such that oh, come on, such that events starts with it so events dot take list dot count dot list dot length no 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 list dot take events dot count dot sequence equal equals events okay so if that is equal to minus one then module dot handle strike um and i suppose i want to output a log message there so let's copy this line put that here um you entered which is invalid and you entered uh event dot ah uh, I need join string I need join string ah uh, let's let's uh, go here and get join string join string yep there is join string oh let's copy me a join string see copy that here uh, join string comma ah okay right now if we find ah uh, there is there is another issue with this because if if you mouse down on it and then you know you you keep holding it and then it gives you a strike at some point and then you you know let go of it again it shouldn't give you a second strike then um yeah rock dude i'm kind of doing that Except that it needs to be flexible enough to um, to take account of all of these different variants. So um, I need to find if the number of times that you mouse down is the same as the number of times that you mouse up. So if uh, events dot count uh, e equals down. Or let, let's say that you've upped at least 
as often as the number of times that you've downed. Okay. Okay, so if you've upped as Lisa, then, then we check if, if it's valid, and if it's not valid, then you get a strike, and then we will... Um, hmm. See, what I'm stuck at right now is I don't know what the last item is. You know, it could be anything. It could be a mouse up or a mouse down. Actually, it can't be a mouse up. Sorry, it can't be a mouse down is what I mean. Unless there is a bug, but, uh, you know, let's just assume for a moment that there isn't. Um, so let's say you do, you know, let, let's say you do something like, uh, something like, let's say you do something like this, right? Um, which would be a down here, then an up here, uh, and then another down up, okay? So up until the second down, it is still valid because it could be this. And then as soon as the up happens, that's where it should give you a strike because this is invalid. And at that point, the last item will be an up. In which case, it's fine if we just clear the list. It'll be fine if we just completely wipe it. Um, another possible thing would be if you do... If you do this, and you forget this. Okay, so you do a click, and then two ticks happen, right? And at that point, it would also be invalid, and then the last thing is a tick. At which point, we probably want to keep the tick. Yeah, we want to keep the tick. So, I think I'm going to pretend that there's always a tick. So I'm actually just going to clear the list and then just add a tick as if there had been one. I'm just going to count the strike as if it were a tick. Uh, it will usually not matter because the user is going to wait for the next tick uh, after the strike. You know, it's going to be less than a second. Um, but, you know, even if they want to try again within the same second after the strike, they can. I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, so now we have that. Now we need to process a digit. Uh, which is, let's say, which is not a valid digit. And then here, if digit is different from um, infos, you know what? I'm going to... Oh yeah, this, this can also be a read-only. Um, I'm actually going to have a um, info thing here so that I can much more easily refer to it. Uh, and I don't have to keep looking at this dictionary. So, um, if infers already contains it, oh wow, if it does not already contain it, there was a bug, then we're going to add it uh, to the dictionary, but we're also going to set info to it. And then here I can just say info, right? And then, and then I don't need to pass the serial number anymore, and all of these. All of these I can replace with info. There you go. Oh, I do want the serial number. Haha. <laughs> oh. Great. Okay, fine. String serial number. Let's put that back. Okay, info dot solution. Yeah, right. Info dot solution. We have digital expected len. Okay. Right, and this again should be info. Okay, so now I don't need the serial number anymore to uh, look at the current info. So if this digit is different from the solution code at the point of uh, the number of digits that we've already entered, um, then we need to give a strike because it's a wrong digit. You entered, which is a wrong digit. I expected that. So I entered digit and I expected info dot solution code info dot digit.
Okay. My mouth is starting to get a bit dry from all of this talking, so I'm going to take a quick um, drink. In the meantime, go ahead and uh, talk to me. What do you think so far? Do you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or concerns? Please leave them in the chat. Um, and let me hear it. Drink break. It's not going to be much of a break. I just poured myself some some drink. Okay, here we go. Okay, so if the digit is correct, however, then uh, info dot digit entered plus plus. Right. And for now, I know this is wrong, but I'm going to say if uh, digit entered is equal to digit expected, which means that we're done. I'm going to say module dot uh, handle pass. The reason this is wrong is because it needs to mark itself as solved earlier if there are more than one. But for now, <laughs> Sparker boy, it's because of Elias. Elias has introduced this uh, pan panda <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> panda pandemic. Mm. Ah, drinks are good. Who knows? Okay. So I'm going to have a is solved, which I'm going to put here. Private bool is solved, which is initially false. And then in our uh, mouse down and mouse up, I'm going to say if not is solved. Um, if not is, is solved. If not is solved. Wow, well, pandemic, I like it. Yep, that's right, I like it too. <laughs> Just came up with that randomly. Okay. So for the second, for the third digit, which is a two, we have this here. We have tick um, down up, tick down, tick up, and then another tick. Or maybe we can tolerate the up here and just you know not not check for the tick. Now, I think I do want to check for the tick. Um, okay, now we have tick, down, tick, up, down, uh, tick, up, tick. And then finally, for the last one, we have tick, down, tick, tick, up, tick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. More like it. Okay. Um. So these are our five digits. Whew. Some other IRC client is the IRC client that most. Which uh, you know, it's chatty. It's called chatty. Um, oh, no tooltip. Okay. Well, anyway, help about. There you go. Chatty. And someone's probably gonna tell me that version is out of date or something. <laughs> okay. Close that. Okay. Let's test if this works. Um, Unity. Run my module. Okay, here we go. Solution code is three to ooh. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh. It never registered the down. Oops. Tick down. Tick 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 up. 
So it registered the mouse up before it registered the mouse down. Let me check that. Um, on interact is mouse down. No, that that was very weird. Let's seriously hope that that doesn't happen in the game. Let's hope that that is a. Um. Okay, so I've already got three strikes from that, so that was horrible. But okay, so the first digit is supposed to be a two. Let's see if I can successfully enter a two, uh, which is a uh, click and then hold for one. Okay. Keep getting strikes. And there's also lots of tick, 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 tick in there. Um, okay, that, that, that is a bit very buggy. So let's, um, no, it's not a mouse detection module. I'm not, not even sure what you mean by that. I mean, it's a module where you click and let go, which is like the button, the vanilla button. That's, that's all, all it is. Except that it's apparently not working very well. Um, so actually, I think I'm just going to put a little safeguard in. And I'm going to say that the um, mouse up, if this happens when, when there is no corresponding mouse down in the event list. Right, so if not is solved and events count uh, down equals events count up. Okay, so if you get an extraneous up event, then it'll just literally just ignore it. So let's go back to Unity. And run this. It still took the up. Okay, I'm I, I want I want to know. This. Let me sure if I put the correct select. Yeah, it is the hole. Um, okay. Okay, so I'm going to put some logging in for when the uh, events actually happen. So let's put in some logging here. Down. Um, up. Tick. Oh. Really? Oh, okay then. That's interesting. Um. Controller. Up. Let's try that. Indeed, this time I did not get a mouse up. Okay, so now if I click. Hmm. I did not. G oh. Oh, I, I see. When I, when I do this, I need to say last time equals time. <laughs> so I need to detect when it actually changes. Right. Okay, um, <sighs> hmm, it's still, it's still got an up event. It's still got an up event, even though I specifically have that, um, that if in there, which says that. You see, it shouldn't be adding that, and it shouldn't be calling check events, so it shouldn't be giving me a strike. Um, okay, fine. Um, yeah. Let's try that, just different names.
Yeah, it still registers an up event. That is really weird. Um. Let's see what the number of downs and ups are in the list at the start, because they should really be. Uh, Oh, you're right. It is. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? I want down to be one more, right? I want that to be greater. Thank, thank you, Kate says. I am an idiot. Okay. Let's try that then. Aha, so now it ignores the app. Okay, very good. Phew. Um. Oh. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw a missing in there. Oh, interesting. Oh, it's because I destroy the object, that's why. Okay, so the first digit of the code is zero, so let's try that. You entered a zero, which is a wrong digit. I expected zero. <laughs> and then after that, I get a strike because... Oh my gosh, this is so buggy. That's incredible. Am I completely incompetent right now? Okay. Um... Let me remove the... Actually, Kate, since you're here, I know that there is an option in Unity. Oh, there you go. That's what I wanted. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I shouldn't have the tick uh, at the start. Um, so I'm going to, like, bef before, like, at the start, in the start, I'm going to set time, uh, as in last time, to the start time. Okay. Um, okay, let's go back. Um, okay, so it said here that I entered zero, which is the wrong digit, I expected zero. Even though digit is here and info solution code digit entered is here. It how can it possibly output the same digit here and still be in that that is so strange. Okay, well let's let's take a look at this again. Oh, and now it doesn't read. Oh, there we go. It does register the text. Okay. So the first digit that we want is a four, which is a long press. So let's do that. One, two, let go. You entered four, which is a wrong digit. I expected four. You're right, Iceman. I literally just thought of that as you wrote it. Um, because. Digit is an integer, whereas the solution code is a string. So minus zero. This is it. Thank you, Iceman. Thank you very much. Very good. So um, well, Iceman has figured out. So what actually happened is uh, four uh, is not equal to. Um, well, you see, zero has actually four has a character code this, which in uh, decimal is, uh, so that's 34, which in decimal, hello, it doesn't let me switch to decimal, okay, there you go, it's 52, right, so it was comparing 4 and 52, and that is indeed not equal, so, okay, here we go, you know, now that I think about it, maybe the solution code shouldn't be a string. Maybe it should be a list of int. And then here, we're going to say this is a new list of ints. And then here, we're going to say add the digit, which in this case, oh, because that grid, oh no, these are the actual integers, not the characters. Okay, so that's good. Oh, um, I didn't expect it to succeed there. Oh, right, okay, it's just assigned the list. That's good. Um, I suppose at this point I can assign that and that and get rid of that. 
There you go. And then I suppose I can also put that directly in here. There you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Come on. Okay. I think this is good. Now, let's see if I can enter a correct solution once. Um, I agree, Iceman. I absolutely agree. The, hand, the, the way that C Sharp considers characters to be equal to integers with their character codes, um, yeah, I, I don't like that either. Okay, so here we have a black hole. I'm still irritated by the fact that it catches that, that mouse up event. But okay, so the first, uh, we have a, uh, oh, come on. I, I guess I can really exit this now. I keep switching to the wrong Visual Studio. So um, where it outputs the solution code, we now have to join string this. I suppose I'll just do that. And now our solution code is zero, zero. Okay, so let's try a zero. Zero is just one, ho hold for one tick. So you entered zero, which is wrong. I expected zero. You entered zero, which is wrong. I expected zero. That is so strange. Oh, because I actually changed this now. Bah, I'm s such a, such a dolt. Um. Okay, let's try that again. Solution code zero. So let's try that. Um, hold and let go. Tick down. Tick up. Tick. That should have been recognized as a zero. Okay. Um. Here. Tick down. Tick up. Tick. Tick down. Tick up. Tick. It should have recognized that. Why didn't it recognize that? Let's see. Input events per digit. Index of. Yeah. That should have. Oh. Oh, it probably did, and it incremented the variable, and it just didn't tell me. Um. Okay, so we enter the digit, which is correct, and then we need to do essentially the same thing that we did before here, which is to um, uh, to pretend that um, you know just clear all of the events and pretend that there was a tick. Okay, let's start again. Okay, so this time we want a zero. We know how to do the zero. Let's hold and let go. Bang, you entered zero, which is correct. Now the next digit is a one, which requires two separate clicks. You entered one, which is correct. The next one is a three, which requires, ooh, which requires that. So we want two, two, two. three, which is correct. Uh, then we want a four, which is hold for two. One, two, click. There you go. And then another four. One, two. Okay, there is a two here. So the next digit is a two. So that's click and then hold. So let's see. Click and then hold and bingo. You enter the two. And then we want another three, which is hold for one. And then, okay, let's do that. Hold. Ta-da! Module pass. Whew. Okay, now let's um, let's do some invalid input and make sure that we can still, you know, recover. That we can still. Like, so let's see. Let Let's say I I double click. Okay, there you go. You entered that, and that is wrong. I get a strike, and then I want to enter a three, and see if I can. Yep. Very good. So that works. Okay, 
Now, every time that you enter a correct uh, number, I want one of those swirls to disappear, so that at the end of it, when it's solved, there are none of those swirls left. Or maybe, actually, now that I think about it, maybe I want the exact opposite. Maybe I want the swirls to appear, so that when you've solved it, it looks pretty. Right? I don't know which one's preferable. I think I, yeah, I think I want it pretty at the start. Okay. Okay, so there are now three important things that we still need to do. Number one, we need to make sure that the module marks itself as solved, um, even if you're not finished with the code because there are more than one module. Two, uh, we need to shorten the code every time that you solve modules in between uh, digits. Um, and three, what was three? Oh, yes, that's right. I need uh, a, an actual sort of visible indicator that tells you how many digits you've already entered because you you won't be able to tell otherwise right you need to you need to be able to know where in the code you are um it's two o'clock at night maybe i want to continue doing this tomorrow um how many people are actually still watching right now um i i know that this list isn't uh indicative because you know people who have already le le left are probably still in the list so i guess i, I don't know um still watching yeah <laughs> nobody that's right nobody okay so i guess i'll take a break at this point but unlike uh, passively listening unlike what i did with uh simon uh, shrieks last time. This time I'm actually going to stop working on this until my next live stream, which I might do tomorrow. So, you know, 24 hours from when I did this one. So go ahead and tune in again. Uh, 10, but possibly AFK. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're all AFK. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you all for listening, and uh, tomorrow we'll continue right here. I won't do any other work in between. Um, and so you can see all, all of the rest. For now, I'm going to take a break. I'm, I, I need some food and I need to go to bed because it's 2 a.m. And I thank you all for watching and listening. And uh, it has been good fun. I hope you've learned something. If you have any comments, questions, concerns, or suggestions, please feel free to contact me on Discord about it. And I'll see you again tomorrow, maybe, or some other time. Goodbye. <laughs>